morning for those uh, that are here for the Cyber Norms Workshop. Let's begin as soon as possible. We only have one hour and a lot of things to discuss, so we are starting on time. Over there. Welcome, welcome to workshop 63, usual suspects questioning the cyber norm making boundaries. Good morning. Hope you're all well. This is actually the fourth episode of our wonderful IGF series that started back in 2016, yes. when we introduced cyber norms as a subject, uh, in our opinion, very much within scope of internet governance discussions. And I think the series could have gone in two ways. Uh, one, as a good drama, where the technical community could have said, hey, there is this almost two decades long process in the UN First Committee that we haven't heard much about, that everybody's talking about these days, 20 years later, and that can have an effect of altering ways in which the internet behaves, particularly when bad things happen. And from there, a back and forth between the technical people and the government saying, I am the expert. No, I am the expert. No, I am more expert. And you know, the drama evolves like that. So it is very fortunate that uh, our series of workshops have not uh, turned uh, very dramatic. I would say that we have tried hard uh, for them to be more like a romantic comedy. Um, so what is it that we are trying to do here? Essentially, this is all about two disparate communities, governmental and technical, to be able to understand each other a little bit better, and there is no better meeting place to arrange a date between these communities than the IGF. Also, we think a very good subject of conversation is cyber norms, uh, because they are, in a way, the future of internet governance, certain agreements that impact behavior that shape the way the internet works. 
After three successful IGF workshops, I'm glad that our usual suspects, uh, both from government and the technical community, have agreed to meet again for a date. Um, just here and now in public, uh, recorded on video, transcribed. Uh, so, um, from the technical community, who do we have here? And, well, basically, two communities in one uh, the CSERT community, the first responders, the ones that at, are at the very front line of cyber incidents, many of them outside the governmental sphere some of them within, but with a long history of cooperation through trusted channels. We also have here network operators. Ultimately, they are the ones that might tell if a norm is meaningful, as all behavior online occurs within their premises. On the other side, there is the policy community, mostly governmental, having trouble to agree on basic rules on how to be responsible with each other, basic norms of civility. So welcome both sides for an open discussion full of sharing and caring. And uh, Madeline, it is an absolute privilege to be working with you in this uh, series, uh, in, in this romantic comedy. <laughs> and uh, our role here, uh, I think, perhaps is like a couple's therapists, you know. And we're bringing issues out uh, and, and trying to build or fix these relationships. Uh, what, what, what do you think? <laughs> oh, thank you, Pablo. I think all relationships need work, so, uh, you know, and, and sometimes some maintenance. So, uh, yeah, let's see what we can do in an hour. Um, and I guess, look, if, if we, uh, to extend the metaphor, if we, if we uh, say that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, then I guess to an extent the, the tech community is uh, from Jupiter and the policy community is, is from Saturn. And this kind of uh, intergalactic exchange is something that Pablo and I have really um, enjoyed over the last four years and, and feel to be very, very important. Um, the, the, the reason why we think it's so important is because we have been able to push each other and explain to one another different perspectives to our own. And that has expanded our own thinking. And that's, that's something that we try to bring into these workshops is the opportunity for us all to be open to the idea that we don't understand perfectly other perspectives, and it would help if we, if we did understand them better. Because essentially, we can see, and we all, this is nothing new, we, we all acknowledge and understand these problem of knowledge exchange between the technical community and the policy community, and the recognition that that's not a one-way, uh, that that's not a one-way problem that while the policy community always uh, benefits from having better technical advice and, and technical understanding, but also that the technical community very, um, very much would benefit from a better understanding of policy constraints and policy objectives, because there, there can quite often be something of a, of a gap there. Um, I think one of the initiatives that the Secretary General announced on, on Tuesday, this idea of appointing a tech envoy, the, the, a recommendation from the high-level panel uh, report, is a really positive move because I struggle to think of any other area of science diplomacy or technical diplomacy where we, we see so little effective exchange between the scientific or technical community and the diplomatic community. If we were working on uh, nuclear diplomacy or, or climate change governance, we see much better um, engagement with the technical and scientific community than we do uh, necessarily in, in this space. The IGF, of course, is a perfect opportunity for us to do this because these communities come together here. Um, I just want to lay out uh, very quickly what I see as differing perspectives here. And this emerges from the conversations that we've had over the last four years and over the last 48 hours. And that is a recognition here. A lot of us in this room would have been to norm sessions over the last few days. And a lot of us have been to, to a number of technical sessions. The, the international 
um, negotiations over norms of responsible state behavior come from a, quite a different place. They don't come necessarily from a place of wanting to uh, ensure secure transactions over a network or secure um, uh, communications. So really what's happening in, in, at that level is an effort to prevent instability and to prevent an escalation that could come about from a misunderstanding or miscommunication to a kinetic war. So that, that's the, that is the objective of those policymakers and those diplomats. What we're talking about at the technical level of cybersecurity is quite you know, it, it's different. And I think there's a gap there that we need to be mindful of when we, when we, we uh, take the conversation forward to today. And I think it will come out at, at, at different points in our conversation. With that, I'd like to throw over to our, our the third of the three musketeers to Louise Marie Hurel, who will uh, take us through a, a kind of setup of, of, of the norms that we'll, we'll talk about today. Absolutely. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be collaborating for the past years. And really, as Pablo and Madeline have already said, it's really about creating a space for dialogue. And by actually using the term usual suspects, we are trying to see, OK, so how can we bring those that are not the usual suspects to the table? How can we actually ensure that we are bringing the experiences from both sides and just having a conversation about that? And just to set the scene really quickly, um, I think before we, we start sharing a bit more, I think the bigger question over here is how do we see norms and what do we perceive as being a norm? Obviously, at the kind of high-end level that Madeline was talking about, we have, you know, the UNGGE reports that prescribe and, and actually uh, refer to particular norms. But there's also the, the understanding that norms are kind of the everyday practices. So how can we reconcile these, these two realities? How can we reconcile these experiences? Um, so norms um, are... As, I, as we were talking about, they are political artifacts, be it at the technical level, be it at, at the high-end political level. They are political mechanisms that trigger specific actions. They constrain and enable at the same time. And at the GGE, uh, there is one particular norm that we are looking at that we decided as a, as a group to kind of explore, and I'd like to bring it over here, which is a, a norm that talks about requests for assistance. So it talks mainly about states should respond to appropriate requests for assistance by another state whose critical infrastructure is subject to malicious ICT acts. States should also respond to appropriate requests to mitigate malicious ICT activity aimed at the critical infrastructure of another state emanating from their territory. Um, Taking into, into account due regard for sovereignty. So what we see here is at the underlying level, there is the necessity of having any, uh, some kind of communication between states and at different levels to promote this request for assistance. But what does that actually mean? If we look at the experience of the incident response communities, as we'll dive deep, and I'll, I'll stop in a couple of minutes, um, it all started out with a discussion of how, back in 1988, of how we're going to tackle the Morris worm. And then, well, maybe we should just set up a team and set up a focal point to respond to that. But what we see is the visibility of cyber attacks and, the, and how socially, economically, and culturally they are embedded in, in the way our governments operate, in the way our societies operate. There is a new level of visibility that is coming to the forefront. And that is why this conversation is so important. So just to start out, and I'll pass over to Merike, um, I'd like to, to just put out some questions for reflection. The first is, how communication happened when a particular incident occurred? What kind of communication venue, avenues? Who did you talk to? Um, the second one, were official channels meet, needed? Or was it more of a trust-based, informal kind of conversation between experts? Um, the third question is, 
Where, was there any expectation um, that if you raise a request, there will be a response? And the, the fifth one, which is perhaps the most important question, is does this norm, the norm on requesting access uh, or requesting assistance, sorry, um, does it actually help uh, to maintain the trust that has already been ingrained in some ways in the incident response community. Is there something to be said about how these agreements at the UNGGE level and the OEWG, how they spill over to, uh, to the operational level? And how can we actually tackle that? And I'd just like now to pass um, the discussion to those that actually have the kind of on the ground experience, and more specifically to Merike, uh, to kind of explore more deeply the different cases uh, and how a particular incident was tackled. So Mary Kay, over to you. Thank you very much. So my name is Merike Keo. Um, I am Estonian and I happened to be in Estonia and played a part in uh, the 2007 attacks. And actually this, this particular norm is a really good use case. If I try to look at if this norm had existed at that time, how would how that incident was handled, how would it apply and where are some of the gaps? So one of the things with, with Estonia was that in 2007, really the world didn't know about Estonia. It's a very small country. Um, you know, some people may have gone to Tallinn, but really it wasn't necessarily on everybody's radar. But they had become very digitally advanced um, because they needed to, um, to become viable in, in the global eco economic world. And so one of the things uh, that happened was that during the, the incident, um, they had some diplomatic channels, but uh, internally within the country, right, they, they had a proper incident response and they could communicate between all the relevant players. What they did not have was international uh, relations because really it was unprecedented. And so when you, uh, they had established a national cert and they actually were at a conference just around that time with other national certs, but the problem was that they were so new that they hadn't yet built the appropriate trust relationships. So when they asked for help, people were trying to figure out, well, could they trust them or not? And then uh, from the diplomatic channels, again, it was, well, does this really constitute an act of war, right? And who's actually responsible? What is actually going on? Because it was the first time that uh, a nation state was very public about what was going on. And so what ended up happening was there was, uh, happened to be a conference, the RIPE NCC, at, uh, during that time, and there was an ad hoc trusted global operational group where some of the members were in the country. And so they ended up also being part of, of the defense. So what you had was you had some diplomatic channels that were, were trying to get uh, uh, international cooperation, but they didn't quite exist yet, right? The communication channels, the trust channels didn't yet exist. And so as I'm looking at now 12 years later, right, a lot has happened. I mean, because this was a use case where everybody woke up globally to say, you know, we've had all of these discussions about what if something happens, uh, you know, in, in terms of somebody using uh, uh, cyber issues to attack uh, critical infrastructure, what do we do? Now this was a, a, a real life case that people can talk about. Um, and when I look at, uh, you know, this particular norm, what I think of, you know, it has very good intentions, but it's quite ambiguous in terms of how do you operationalize it. So basically, who defines what is an appropriate request? And what is meant by malicious act? Is it physical damage? How extensive? Loss of functionality? Digital espionage? Right? I mean, how do you define that in terms of when do you act? And then also, how do you determine when to escalate and to whom? So I am aware that um, there's the Organization of American States and the Organization of Security and Cooperation of Europe 
that are trying to build uh, these incident response capabilities and operationalizing it. But one of the things that I think is really very important is that when you're creating a norm, that all stakeholders should be involved from the beginning. And this includes policy, legal, technical, operational aspects must be understood. And this will, in my mind, help assure cross-functional transparency and create norms that also can be effectively operationalized. Thank you so much, Merika. Such an amazing story. So I, I guess we, we could see through that example that there is this need for these international channels of communication and, um, and to that extent we might say then that this norm has addressed uh, what, was, what was recognized um, as early as 2007 as a, as a gap and something that needed to be addressed. And now we have this, this proposal through the UNGGE that states recognize that responsibility and, and somehow uphold it. But there are questions still about how actually that's, that, that happens on the ground in the midst of, of an incident. And although we've seen this kind of happen organically now over the, the last uh, 12 years, we want to think more consciously going forward about how these things are, are um, discussed and negotiated. So perhaps then um, we, we're going to throw to, uh, to Martin, for, who has a, a, another example. Martin, would you like to talk about your experiences, please? Sure. Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation uh, to be here today. So the example I wanted to bring up is actually one that's often considered to be a norms breaker, as in it was an incident that led to many people starting the discussion about cyber norms. Um, and it happened in June of 2017 when a piece of malware called NotPetya uh, suddenly was discovered. And it was first believed to be a variant of an old piece of ransomware called Petya. Um, and what it did was it actually infected very large enterprises, shut down the uh, large shipping company Maersk at the time and had a lot of public media visibility. Now, what turned out was that NotPetya actually didn't appear to be intended as ransomware. It presented itself as such, but in reality, it didn't actually contain the necessary features to decrypt information when a payment was made. And once a system was infected with NotPetya, it would start infecting other systems by exploiting uh, shared credentials between systems and two specific Windows vulnerabilities. What made NotPetya special was the vector through which the infection actually happened. Um, at the time, many of the corporations that were originally affected did business in Ukraine and used one very specific application called MeDoc, which was accounting software uh, that was very common there to file taxes. Now, it turned out uh, after this company brought in forensic investigators that their update servers had actually been compromised and malware was deployed as an update on the system so that anyone who went and did the right security thing, installed their patches, would get the malware on their systems. And then from there, the malware would spread through the enterprise networks, often across country borders, through VPNs and other internal networks. Now, this was a very impactful incident. Uh, later quotes that were shared by um, the White House, for instance, in the US, were that overall, NotPetya probably cost about $10 billion. I can't really speak to the accuracy of those numbers, but it was very widely perceived to be a very impactful incident. But interestingly enough, relatively speaking, it wasn't very complex. It was a very simple type of attack. Now, if we apply this norm to that particular incident, there's a couple of things that immediately stand out. The first one is related to appropriate requests for assistance. This particular statement puts a very strong focus on the fact that states need to be responding to a security incident like this. And that's something that I think is actually more debatable than we, we often think it is. The origin of the attack in this case is pretty fuzzy because there's really two different incidents. There's this company with an update server being compromised, and then there's the affected organizations that actually install the malware and the malware starts spreading. Second, government incident response teams or national certs actually play a relatively minor role in this specific incident. When you think of the flow of an incident responder, when your corporation is affected by malware that's deployed through, for instance, a third party system, typically you start responding and as the organization yourself, you reach out to the appropriate other cert within the CCERT community to gain assistance. 
If we try to insert a national cert there, then in many cases we're adding latency and we're not actually adding a lot of productivity. And in cases like NotPetya, where malware spreads very quickly, that can be a real challenge. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a role for national certs. There is absolutely a role for these national organizations to help respond, coordinate, and get awareness to other companies out there. But it isn't always going to be coordinating the response to try and end the attack. The second piece that is a bit challenging is the definition of critical infrastructure. Now, there is actually very little agreement between states on what critical infrastructure truly means. And in addition to that, if you think of accounting software, and in this case a large shipping company, it's actually quite debatable whether that's critical infrastructure anywhere. The ports, for instance, may be, and they may be affected by an impact on these companies, but really we're looking at the supply chain of critical infrastructure here, as opposed to critical infrastructure directly. And third, um, there's a, a note there around responding to requests to mitigate. And that's a bit concerning, because I think in many ways that's modeled after the fact that an attack consists of a flood of traffic from one country to another, where there's actually something that technically could be done. In this case, that's not the case. It's actually all encrypted traffic. In many cases, it was transferring over enterprise VPNs. There aren't really that many things that a state could do to really mitigate that attack as it's egressing its borders. And if we try to push states towards that point, towards being able to do that, we might actually be aligning some incentives that aren't really very fantastic. Uh, for instance, malicious ICT activity can be defined in a number of different ways. And second, incident responders often have no ability to stop traffic. And if we ask them to be able to do that, then being able to do that in a rights-respecting way becomes a very, very important concern. Now, I do want to flag that I actually think from a technical community perspective, the development of these norms is very helpful, and it's a very good and solid discussion. But I think what we kind of learn when we look at a real incident in the context of this particular norm, that there are many challenges in both proper design and implementation of the norm. And if that implementation is misaligned or doesn't really match reality and how we actually respond to an incident, then those unmet expectations are actually likely to decrease predictability instead of increase it. So for me, that's a, a very big takeaway looking at this and several of the other um, UNGGE norms in the context of an actual live incident. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, I think it would be good now to, to bring in a, a policy response or a policy perspective on, on these, um, these scenarios that we've had where we're you know, um, Martin now has kind of skipped ahead 10 years from, from America's example um, to look at an, another scenario where these, these issues of requesting assistance are, are clearly quite complex, um, still important, still, uh, still central to resolving an incident. But as, as Martin points out, these incidents are complex. It's not always clear who needs to be involved in the discussion, and the national certs are not always uh, the, the, the right partner. And in some cases, they, they may even, um, Martin suggests, you know, introduce this latency or this delay that's really counterproductive in, in addressing an incident. Um, so, Liam, um, I wonder if you could um, just reflect a little bit on how do you see these scenarios connecting with the work that, that, uh, that you and the Australian government do in, in the GGE on, on proposing and, and um, uh, defining norms for, of reasonable, responsible state behavior? And how do you see the role of the state when you uh, hear a, a scenario like that laid out? Oh, thanks, Madeline. Um, I think it's important to consider the context of the discussions that are happening um, uh, originally in the GGE, now in both the GGE and the open-ended working group. Um, these are discussions that come from the first have been come from the first committee of the United Nations, which is focused on disarmament. So this is uh, political discussions, as you said earlier, on preventing activities that will affect international peace and security. Um, things that may inadvertently escalate to a conflict between states, and in that they are focused on uh, discussion and agreement of the role of states as an actor in cyberspace. Um, 
The other aspect is that because these are political discussions in a multilateral forum, they reflect very long, very detailed, very hard-fought negotiation to achieve consensus text that states can agree to. Um, and in doing so, we do unfortunately lose a level of specificity about many of the terms. Um, but this is a necessary ambiguity to achieve agreement to what is a, a general standard or agreement on the behaviour of actors in cyberspace. So um, I, I will accept the criticism that there is uh, a lack of detail about many of the terms included in there, but I would also say that they are necessary to a, achieve the agreement in the first place. So in that context, um, what I'd say is that the, the GGE norms uh, are really a very clear sign, and, and the fact that there, there are two processes happening now to discuss these issues, both from First Committee, are a clear sign that states are concerned, very concerned about the implications for cybersecurity incidents to international peace and security, uh, and that there is a growing consensus around very basic standards of behaviour, both positive and negative obligations. Many of the norms are impose a negative obligation on the state. Um, but the, they are a clear indicator that um, a peaceful and stable cyberspace is the objective of all states in the UN. Uh, and that is through uh, the various processes of it and means available to multilateral diplomacy what states are working towards. So I, I think you know, we do come at this from a different perspective. When um, you're in negotiations, you're not often thinking about the very detailed aspects of how they'll be implemented, but rather setting a very clear uh, signpost of what responsible state behaviour looks like uh, and what the expectations of the international community are of actors in cyberspace in responding to serious cyber incidents. So from that point, I would see this as the start of the conversation, as setting a very clear indicator of where the start and what the expectations are. Um, and then, and I mean, we consider the norms as part of a broader framework that includes international law, confidence building measure, and capacity building. So looking at those other various means in which to implement the various normative agreements, including through um, bilateral, regional, and global um, forums, including the ASEAN Regional Forum, we've been working very hard uh, in that forum to implement capacity, uh, confidence building measures about negotiation uh, and engagement between states in an in, in, during an incident, um, which we've worked very hard with Malaysia to achieve agreement on a, on a directory so that at the state and the government level, we can discuss and have clear points of contact to reach out to in a serious, serious cyber incident. Um, so in, in that context, I'd see that, yeah, we're, we're at the start of a discussion about um, defining what is appropriate and how we will respond to serious incidents. We have very good agreements uh, that have come through the 2015 process. Uh, we're now hoping to get some very clear guidance from the 2019-20 process on how to implement that and working through the open-ended working group as well to understand how capacity building as well um, can assist to implement the norms across uh, the global community. Thanks. We were talking this morning, Madeline, about how so many things relate to football. <laughs> and in particular, we were talking about different stakeholder groups, for example, the owners of the team, the managers of the team, and the team players. And the stories that we just heard from Merike and from Martin are stories that the um, level of the playing field at the, at the level of the players and perhaps uh, the stories that we're hearing from, from Liam are mostly at the um, C-suites of the owners of the team and, and these are conversations that are sometimes difficult to bridge and I think we can progress a little bit further through the norm that Louise Marie exposed sort of on how to bridge those conversations and I would like to, to ask um, Christine and, and Sumon. Christine from the CSER community and Sumon from the network operator community, how have you lived uh, sort of this particular norm in your area of work? Uh, let's start with Christine. 
So thank you, Pablo, and, and thanks, everyone. Um, I think we are still trying to, to grasp exactly what that would mean. And I think we have a problem in, in we still have a problem in the sense that the technical community has a long way to go to understand how the norms space work and why it is important to be unprecise sometimes. But I also think that uh, the norms people should understand our perspective as instant response teams, that we are worried with all the things that Mariki and Mart brought, that is the latency, that is uh, when you have to avert an incident from escalating, you need to be swift, you need to be quick, and you actually shouldn't be worrying if you are uh, supposed to have to contact someone from like a, a government or not. So you are trying to prevent a worm from spreading. You are trying to prevent critical infrastructure from stopping working. And uh, it's really difficult to do that if you need to think, uh, what is my territory? So like when I look at these norms, the first thing that jumps to me is how do you define a territory in cyberspace? We have uh, not only VPNs, but we have internet exchange points. We have traffic passing through uh, different countries that don't even belong to that country. Uh, if we go, for example, for the Amsterdam internet exchange points, we have, it's a very international one. So there is traffic from everywhere. So what would the Netherlands do to stop Germany talking to like uh, Belgium just because the traffic is passing through or something like that. So it's, uh, and for the technical community, it's difficult to understand how to implement. And for CDC certs, uh, it's very difficult for us to grasp how to operationalize that. And I think it, it kind of creates a doubt on, on how to maintain trust and how to build. And if we go back to the work of the best practice forums on certs and C certs that were here in the IGF in 2014 and 15, the major conclusions is for instant response uh, teams to be effective, they need to build trust. Uh, for this trust to be built, it's, it's really difficult. It's usually based on people building trust. Uh, timing is really uh, a very uh, big issue. So we really need to be able to communicate freely. And, and CSERTs are already uh, discussing a lot like data protection laws and some other information and trying to grasp what we can share without infringing laws. So I think the most important from our perspective is if, if the norms community understand a little bit how the norms uh, translate on how, because we will be the ones implementing the norms in, in the extent, not all of it. So would that prevent us from implementing? So this is some of the things that worry us. So would us trying to abide by the norm actually make things worse? So th this is why I think we, we still need a lot of discussion. And of course, I think both communities need to understand each other and, and talk more freely and, and be able to really exchange these worries. It's not that we don't want, we think that norms are very important, but when we get some cases, then we start realizing how difficult it is to actually know if we, what we are doing and if we're contributing to the norm or if the norm is helping us or not. So it's just some food for thought on that. Uh, I'm Shuman uh, from the technical community from Bangladesh and uh, working as a network service provider. And uh, when we talk about norms, uh, in tech community we have our own norms of working and uh, we work close together. And uh, so far it's working so seamlessly without having any proper controlling authority or mechanism, it's working fine. But when you talk about these norms where we're discussing, if you point out today what uh, bring the table that uh, cooperation among the states in any cyber incidents. I just want to bring with example from Bangladesh in the last two years, uh, I think it's almost two years, that uh, the money from the Bangladesh Central Bank in transport to some Filipino casino and one of us in Sri Lanka, and it's done so nicely, it has been so nicely that in Friday, Bangladesh is closed, some order went from Bangladesh to U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. They transferred the money on that night, Saturday, Sunday. Saturday is closed everywhere. Sunday morning, when the Bangladesh Bank people came in the office, they found that a large chunk of money is transferred to the different country. 
So they initially tried to communicate with those different country banks. On Sunday, all Sri Lanka and Philippines is closed. Monday, there is a special holiday in Philippines. On Tuesday, they found that uh, the money is transferred from to a casino and it's gone. It's become chips. And the government and Bangladesh people came to know about it one week after that, when there's a news in the Filipino newspaper that something happened there, some money transferred from Bangladesh and so on. And then we started investigating. So here you can see that, that uh, if we talk norms in the top level only, only government officials, it doesn't really work. It should be cascaded down to the end user, not only the technical community. The banks, the other organizations, they should be able to know that these are the norms and how we can execute the norms when an incident happens. What Mariki was mentioning, that there is a framework, a, a communication channel, and everybody should know that, that if anything happens like that, how we should move forward. It's not there. So bank didn't even inform the government. They tried to do in their banking channel to resolve the issue. It didn't work. Then they moved back to government. And in the second phase, now there is two governments, two different countries. Still, that cooperation didn't work properly. Still, the case is under investigation. There is some uh, Bangladesh government put, filed case in, in US court, in Filipino court, but no tangible outcome from there. So we're setting up norms, but it's really we are not committed to that. It's the government or other organizations. And it's not cascading down to the downstairs. Like from the regional committee, as I am coming to IGF, I keep to know about norms, all these things. But if you go to a technical forum, nobody knows about this kind of norms has been there, and that has a value. And, and even they know the norms, but they don't know how to actually execute those. So there are the challenges, I think. Probably it's not about defining the knowledge. And what Mediki was telling earlier, that uh, when we're defining something, all communities should work together. So, and uh, in case that you can make follow up the technical example, like uh, in, in our region, we have our policy discussion, we're discussing the policy, and we're finding a way of implementation of that policy. So only doing policy probably will not serve the purpose. So we need to think about norms in a different way. Thank you. I hope you're finding these stories around the incidents in Estonia, uh, not Petya, the Bangladesh ban heist, sort of a useful tool to analyze uh, sort of how these norms can be meaningful or not, and, and how the development of those norms can somehow improve. It is now time to open for comments uh, in order to try to bring the discussion a bit further. So I will have Liam, Alex, Olaf, What's your name? OK. Thanks. Uh, I think, I mean, it is really useful to hear the, the practical experience of the people who are on the ground implementing it. Um, I, I think that um, we still have a, a, a process to go through in terms of implementation that each state has to look at and each, um, you know, each so the sort of regional groupings that we have to use to do these things. <laughs> Um, have to go through. I, I think the, the process of having the, the agreement on norms is to set, I suppose, a direction or a clear guideline line for the community on this is our expectation that you will share information in an incident, um, not to define how you do it or when you do it, because we aren't the experts in how that happens. We, we are trying to create the conditions in which cyberspace can be peaceful and secure. Uh, through agreement between states. Uh, the process that needs to happen then is um, each state looks at the obligations those norms imp um, impose on them. Australia has done this recently. We actually tabled it uh, in the UN as part of the open-ended working group on how we are working as a government to implement the normative agreements we've made in the UN. Um, that is a process that each country will have to go through. Um, and in fact, we, and through our capacity building program, are working in ASEAN states to do just that. Um, the other comment I'll make too is that the, the concept of norms in cyberspace is actually a, an interesting one from a, um, 
the context of international security in that in many ways we're doing it back to front. Norms uh, are generally developed over a very long-term practice that then is um, turned into um, international law through uh, very long, long, very long discussions. This has happened through a range of issues, law of the sea, um, probably a very good example of how <clears throat> practice that has developed over thousands of years is over the long term codified into to state practice in international law. So in, in terms of discussing norms for cyberspace, what we're trying to do is sort of kickstart that process and uh, have a really clear view from the get-go on what is, what is the standard of um, conduct and the expectations we have um, that um, then we can then we can look at implementation. Normally, you would impl you would have implementation flow through, and then agree that is that is the normative standard of behaviour, and then that would over long term become international law. We're doing this all back to front, so it's a, it's an interesting process to watch, um, and I enjoy doing it. But th this is the I think the, the the start of the process. As I said, it's up to each state to look at how they can implement the obligation that the norm um, has on them as a country. Uh, look at. Uh, how, as a global regional kind of groupings, we can implement that, and then at the greater level through the global community. Thanks. Liam, could I just follow up on one very interesting thing you, the, one interesting point you made there? You said we're, we're doing this back to front. Normally, um, norms evolve over time. We recognise them as, as common practices and common values. Why are we doing it back to front? Because um, we don't have time. We don't have time to allow um, this to evolve um, in that sort of very long-term natural process because of the speed and the pace of the technology and the, the reach that it has um, across the world. And th so the impact on our societies, our economies, our national security, uh, the potential there is so enormous that we need to kickstart this process and make this happen much faster. Alex? Thank you, Pablo. This is Alejandro Pisanti from the National University of Mexico. Thanks for inviting me to be a member of this distinguished panel. It's uh, really exciting to take part in this discussion. Um, so let me hitch what I was planning to say on Liam's recent statement. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to see that you are premising the GGE norms making process on the hypothesis that you don't have time uh, yet. The process has been going on for several years. It's in its second or third cycle. Uh, it is sixth cycle. It's on its sixth cycle, uh, which, each of which has been like three years or more. Uh, there's also the open-ended working group, which is a parallel, pro a parallel and, uh, let's say, hostile or competing process. There will probably be a third uh, process trying to be friends of the friends of the chair of each. Uh, so for something that's really uh, you know, time pressed, this doesn't look like in a hurry. A hurry, time pressure, is what Christine feels, where, uh, uh, or, or Martin, people who are in the CER CERTs and CSIRTs, they really have to respond in, in minutes to decide what's happening, where the so what the source is, and what the appropriate action is. Uh, from the technical and operational side, uh, the norms making process at the General Assembly looks very much like countries trying to uh, cover their backs and saying we did something. So whatever can be achieved is having done something. But there's no chain of command, there's no reporting chain that goes down to the certs and C certs, which are often working in a very different regime. I have recently published a, a paper where I, I, I think I exhibit, if not show, if not demonstrate, the cost of these regime crossings. You have a multilateral regime trying to operate at a very high level of the General Assembly, at the abstraction level of full countries. You have the operational regime, which is, of course, within the law. It's not against the law. It's not a lawless or ungoverned space, as uh, is often said. But you have uh, this hap these things happening much more in the multi-stakeholder regime of the internet, way before it was called that way, from the IETF, uh, the nano and other operational uh, operators groups coming together, and they are trying to uphold the laws 
Uh, they're never against the law, but they are basically trying to gain legitimacy, not from having been, you know, all the way from elected governments to the top of the General Assembly, but legitimacy by effectiveness. And these are very different regimes. Uh, countries that are playing both games, the game of both regimes, or regime crossing, or even more uh, arbitrage, are actually being more effective by, let's say, coming over here and say, well, we discuss cybersecurity in the multi-stakeholder forum, and we take our conclusions to the General Assembly. They take whatever they want. Uh, there's no, sometimes not even a connection between the foreign office and the technical or communications office that comes here. So this disconnect is very damaging, and in the end, it's damaging for the operation of the people who are out in the front lines, like the certs and C-certs, uh, who don't have a proper mandate, and who are actually even uh, in co facing conflicting laws, for example, for data protection and the mandate for security. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Olaf? I, I, yeah, um, Olaf Kolkman, Internet Society. I have had the pleasure of um, uh, uh, serving in the Global Commission for Stability of Cyberspace. Um, I come from a, um, uh, an environment, uh, a technical environment, where I so recognize what uh, Alejandro just said. I'm going to give you two times. 24 February 2008, 1847 UTC, and Sunday, 24 February 2001, UT 2101 UTC. That's the duration of the Pakistan YouTube incident, which brought down a part of the internet. That is a just a little bit more than two hours response time on a global scale in coordination with 60,000 networks. That's what we're talking about if we look at the, um, at the implementation scale. And the people who do that self-identify as the technical community. The technical community shares a set of norms to keep the internet running and to keep the environment secure. Um, I think that is often forgotten, that that is what self-identification of the technical community means. A shared set of norms to keep our environment safe. And the people at that side of the table uh, described how they are working at it. On the other hand, there is the responsibility of states to not escalate these type of events into full kinetic war. And that's the conversation that is going on at the GG and the open-ended working group. And those are two different discussions with using similar words, but similar words that mean different things to the two communities. I gave the example yesterday, Deutsche Industrie Norme, DIN. The word norms in, is in there. Um, ISO norms, those are all technical standards. And when people talk about norms in that context, they think about completely different things than the norms that, uh, uh, that we're talking about in the GGE, the norms around uh, 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 responsible state behavior. Um, also, stability. Stability in a technical context means completely different things than the stability question in the international context. Um, I do think it is very important to bridge those discussions because it is very important to understand for the technical community that on the longer timescales of interstate behavior and making sure that things don't escalate if these type of attacks, these type of incidents happen, that there are mechanisms that make sure that NotPetya is well understood, it's, re uh, it's attributed, and that uh, states are being held to account if a state actor is behind that. That is on a different time scale than the immediate incident response that is taking place. And I think that the worry of the technical community in this is, oh, we might not be able to get our work done if these norms are misunderstood or misimplemented at regional, national, or technical level. Thank you, Olaf. I committed the floor to two more, and we also need to wrap up, and we have six minutes. So I'll give you the word for a tiny bit, then Blada, then Luis. 
Thank you. My name is Amit Ashkenazi. I'm the legal advisor of the Israeli National Cyber Directorate. So that tells you two things about my intervention. First, I'm a lawyer. I work for the government, three things. And we operate the National CSERT. And in my intervention, I would like to share our views in bridging these very distinct fields. One is the language of diplomacy, of the high-end stuff, and I completely uh, relate to the discussion between the diplomats and the technicians. And I'm a domestic policy lawyer. And I think that as we see uh, the challenges rising in cyberspace for CSERTs and national CSERTs, there is a role for domestic law and domestic lawyers to create better interfaces for cooperation. So we have relied for a lot of time, this is what the IGF has discussed in many places, on the ingenuity and common shared norms of the technologists. But now we are reliant on cyberspace in a much heavier duty. The risks to the technical community and to the proper functioning of our societies are greater. And there is a role for the law there to assist. Um, we will be having a panel tomorrow discussing specific um, issues in which the law can assist. We are looking at the case study of Recital 49 of the European General Data Protection Regulation because we see it as a use case of where the European legislator and additionally in the US we have a similar law and we are developing the similar type of law in Israel in which the law interferes in order to make information sharing easier and to assist national CSERTs in their mission. And by that way, we can reduce some of the friction, the unnecessary friction that legal risk may create to national CSERTs in a net positive way. And this is a case, we can talk about other cases if uh, people are interested, where domestic law and domestic law interoperability can promote uh, stability and cybersecurity in a more pragmatic way and bridging between these two very different disciplines. Thank you. This is a very welcome contribution. Thank you so much, uh, Blada. Thank you, um, Vladimir Radunovic from Dipl Foundation. Thanks for the great discussion. I just wanted to um, put another uh, component into thinking is um, when we look at the incident where conflicts around the world, we usually, in these discussions about norms, we think about Russia, China, US, and the big, big guys. But 50% uh, of the conflicts today are in Africa. They're in Middle East. Um, cyber, well, they, those sort of tensions and conflicts actually need any spark, and cyber will very soon become a spark which can turn uh, into tensions, into conflict. So I think we need to, in future discussions, probably focus more on even those small sub-regional examples and try to bring these guys as well around the table, because that's where the next uh, actual war will start from the cyber effect. Uh, and when you look into these countries, we've done a lot of trainings in, in countries on how to establish a national mechanism on ex uh, responding to an incident, uh, even there is total chaos. You might have a contact point which is appointed as an international contact point, but on a national level, they don't know wh who, which institution works on what. So even response on a national level is, is hard, let alone helping someone else uh, in, in this case of, of, of a request. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vlada. I think it was an interesting progression towards our concluding remarks, and I think um, that is perhaps one of the questions that I had and, and where I think maybe we're headed with this discussion, and perhaps that's a subject for another, yet another panel. Um, just to kind of wrap up, I think there are at least three themes that we talked and that we touched upon today. Not only when we think about requests for assistance, which was our starting point, but like how do we connect, um, as I said in the beginning, the realities of kind of the operational everyday uh, incident response and at kind of the diplomatic level and thinking international peace and security. And I think the first challenge is in terms of implementability. When, and actually the question is, what do we actually mean with implementability, right? What kind of implementation are we looking for when we, we look at a norm such as the one that we are talking about, which talks about requests for assistance? As Christine mentioned, it's, it's a question of how do we know who actually attacked? Is it a non-state actor? Is it a state actor? And I think these are questions that revolve around different perceptions of what these norms can actually be how they can actually be implemented. On the one hand, we have the
this kind of demand of thinking, all of the constraints that it brings at the operational level, but at the kind of the diplomatic side, there is the level of consensus building. There is the level of kind of bringing this language to the forefront of international peace and security discussions. The other, the other question is a question about temporality. And the, the question of temporality is exactly that latency that we heard about earlier today and how do we actually make sure that we're responding on time? Uh, and at the same time, how do we make sure that we have the time necessary to build that kind of dialogue and consensus and actually exchange the knowledge between this particular community that has been working on the front line for many years and the policymakers and even the diplomats who are negotiating what attribution means, what at an attack means, how you're going to implement international law in cyberspace. And that has a spillover, undeniably a spillover, to the national level. And that is the kind of a bridge that we're trying to make here, which leads me to the last point, just to conclude, which is a point on capacities. And what are the kinds of capacities that we need to actually tackle that? On, on the side of kind of like the technical community, we talked about, you know, trust building, and Mary Kay gave a great example of, in the early days, how there wasn't trust yet. And that was a constraint to kind of like having an effective response and how gradually different countries are still building that and it's an ongoing process. Uh, but the main question that I would like to conclude and going to Vlada's point is what are the policy players that are able to connect this mismatching temporalities, this mismatching implementation, not, uh, ideas of implementation and capacities. And I guess the answer to that, which I would agree, is perhaps we should look at the national cybersecurity governance ecosystems and how do you actually bridge those that are, let's say, at the national computer incident response teams, the policymakers, the legislators, and the diplomats. Because I think it's a flow of information that is ingrained in kind of like how these domestic or regional structures, how do they exchange knowledge and information of what is actually a, a, an attack and what is an incident and what do you do when you have to respond to something. And these kinds of information are clearly not circulating as much as they should. And perhaps that is per the structural element, aside from like the governance structures in each country or regionally, that should be in place. So how do we build these, um, these fronts? And I guess just to close with like getting on the policy side, I guess it's also thinking about the implementation of capacity building and confidence building measures. And I think that is still a very open-ended question when we think about, you know, we need to have a cert. And how do we make that? How do we implement that? And I think the implementation is always coming round and round. So I guess that is the panorama. And this is kind of setting the scene for our next football game and seeing which are the players that we actually need to connect, right? Um, so yeah. As every good therapy session, this has to be cut short just when the most important things were starting to emerge. So put for thought and until next time, thank you so much to all that came here and participated. <laughs>